We're in Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 3 to be exact. We've, uh, the pastor has uh, been going through Ephesians, uh, Ephesians 2, the last few weeks, um, and we'll be starting on Ephesians 3 this morning. If you'd like to turn there, Ephesians chapter 3, we'll be starting in verse 1. This past week, I read a rather interesting article uh, as I was scrolling through some news sources. About a year ago, the Pentagon released three videos uh, depicting what, it, what is shown as unidentified flying objects. Uh, the validity of these videos are, um, are shady at best, uh, but the Pentagon said that they were real. So whether real or not, I don't know. The point of the illustration is the Pentagon had access to this footage for many years, but they finally did declassify it and release it to the public. This year, last year, I forget which one it was, but it was deemed as classified information for a long period of time before it was finally brought out into the light and unveiled to all people. What we'll be looking at in Ephesians today is, is similar. We'll be looking at a mystery, something that was hidden for a long period of time before being unveiled to all people. Now, I'm not talking about a mystery as in something that is difficult or impossible to understand. We'll hear people say, you know, the mysteries of space, you know, and things that are impossible to understand. We'll never know. Or you'll hear someone ask a question like, okay, how do you be perfect? Or how do we, how do we calculate eternity? You know, they'll ask you this impossible question, and you'll say, well, it's a mystery. We don't know. And, that, and that's how Google defines it. You know, they define it as a mystery is something that is difficult or impossible to understand. But if we're to understand it from a biblical viewpoint, if we look in the biblical text, it means something very different. Biblically, mystery means something that was hidden and is now revealed. Just like those UFO videos, they were hidden, classified, but then they were unveiled to the public. That's biblically what a mystery is, if we're to look at the Greek word there. But to help, to help me whet your appetite for what a biblical mystery is, Romans 16 tells us, it says this, the, re, the revelation of the mystery that was kept secret for long ages, and remember, it was something hidden, but has now been disclosed and through the prophetic writings have been made known. That, that's, that's what a mystery is. If we see the word in the New Testament, the word mystery, Paul uses it a lot. This is what it is. Something hidden for long periods of time, unveiled, and then it is revealed to all people. You say, what exactly is the mystery we'll be looking at? Well, that's what we're going to find out this morning. This morning, we'll be looking at the mystery, the greatest of all mysteries. Paul is going to unveil this mystery to us in Ephesians chapter 3, verses 1 through 13. And that's a lot of ground to cover, so we won't have time to fully unpack every detail in the verse. So we'll do more of a bird's eye view. What is this mystery? Let's take a look at it. If you want to turn with me to Ephesians or listen along, that's your choice. Ephesians chapter 3, I'll be reading verses 1 through 13. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 1. For this reason I, Paul, a prisoner for Christ Jesus on behalf of you Gentiles, assuming that you have heard of the stewardship of God's grace that was given to me for you, how the mystery was made known to me by revelation, as I have written briefly. When you read this, you can perceive my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to the sons of men in other generations, as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. This mystery is that the Gentiles are fellow heirs, members of the same body, and partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. Of this gospel I have been made a minister according to the gift of God's grace, which was given me by the working of his power. To me, though I am the very least of all the saints, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to bring to light for everyone what is the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God who created all things, so that through the church the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. This was according to the eternal purpose that he has realized in Christ Jesus our Lord 
in whom we have boldness and access with confidence through our faith in him. So I ask you not to lose heart over what I am suffering for you, which is your glory. Let's open with prayer this morning. Father, we thank you so much for your word and for the opportunity to continue in Ephesians, such a wonderful letter that Paul wrote through the Spirit. We just pray, Father, as we would start in uh, Ephesians chapter 3, that you would give us, give us grace as we understand it, as we try to even apply it to our lives. We just pray, Spirit, that you would illuminate our minds, help us to grasp the truths that we'll be finding in your word this morning. We thank you so much for this church, for the people that came out this morning to worship you, to glorify you, and I just pray that you will help us to understand your word completely. We pray this all in Christ's name, amen. <clears throat> so you ask, what's this mystery? Ephesians 3, let's jump in. We're going to see five points about this mystery. Firstly, number one, we're going to see the deliverer of the mystery. We find this in the first four verses. Let's read them together. For this reason, I, Paul, a prisoner of Christ on behalf of you Gentiles, assuming that you have heard of the stewardship of God's grace that was given to me for you, how the mystery was made known to me. So very clearly, Paul's saying, this mystery was made known to me. If we were to unveil a mystery, for example, if we wanted to reveal something that was hidden, we would need someone to deliver it. I use the word deliverer. Some other words would be a courier, a messenger, a modern loose term would be mailman, someone to deliver something. And in these verses here, Paul says, this mystery was made known to me by revelation. So quite clearly, Paul, he's delivering this mystery to us. Now let's look at it again. I, I love the humility here that Paul shows. Do you see it there? Let's read it again. He, he says it here at the beginning. He says, I am a prisoner of Christ. But not just a prisoner, it's on behalf of you guys, right? Uh, and I think this is more literal than we imagine. We hear people say, you know, I'm a slave of Christ. I am somebody that is a prisoner for Christ. I do things for him. But Paul is speaking literally. If you, if re, if you remember, this Ephesians letter is called a prison epistle. It, basically, that means Paul was in prison while he was writing this epistle. Some other ones would be Colossians, Philippians. While Paul is under house arrest, he pens this letter. So when Paul's saying, I'm a prisoner of Christ, he's literally, he's speaking literally here. And I believe Paul's humility shines because he's not writing it for himself. He's in prison. If he was worrying about himself, he wouldn't be caring about writing the letter. But he says, I'm a prisoner of Christ on behalf of the Gentiles. It's for you guys. I'm writing this. I'm not satisfying my curiosity. I'm, I'm genuinely writing it for you guys. So I, just, I believe that shows Paul's humility. And then continuing on, he says, verse 2, I assume you guys have heard of the stewardship of God's grace that was given to me for you guys. Basically what he's saying, guys, I'm not unveiling this mystery for you. I mean, excuse me, I'm not unveiling it for me. I'm unveiling it for you. It's not because of something I did. It's because of God's grace on my life. Not me. It's God's grace. Not for me. It's for you. So Paul, he opens here. He says, I'm delivering this mystery, but then he takes the focus completely on him, off himself. He takes it off of himself and focuses on them. So I believe the humility here it pour, that pours out of his heart is astounding. So as we put all that together, these opening verses show Paul delivers this message, but he quickly says, it's not because of me. I'm not special. It's because of God's grace. It was given to me, and it's for you guys, not for me. And then he goes on to say, this mystery was made known to me by revelation. I'm about to tell you. But look what the end of verse 3 says. I have written briefly. And you say, where's that at? Well, Ephesians 1, we don't have to turn there, but Ephesians 1 reminds us that he's introducing it there. He doesn't completely explain it. Ephesians 1.9, he says, I'm making known this to you guys, this mystery of his will. And then if we look in Ephesians 2, we also see in verse 11, Ephesians 2, therefore remember that at one time you Gentiles in the flesh called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, which is made in the flesh by hands. So he's kind of giving us a sample in chapter 1, chapter 2, and then he comes in in, verse, in chapter 3 and says, 
verse 4 here. He says, when you read this, you can perceive, you can perceive my insight into the mystery of Christ. So he's opening this letter here. He's saying, okay, guys, I, I've briefly written this to you. Uh, I mentioned it in chapter 1, chapter 2, and now we're going to plant here in chapter 3, and I'm going to unveil this mystery to you. When you read this, verse 4, you can perceive my insight into the mystery of Christ. So Paul, he arguably is one of the greatest believers of all time. He opens this chapter, unveiling the mystery. A uh, quick application, let's uh, apply this here. I, I believe, let's just use myself as an example. If, if I were to deliver a mystery that was new to me, I think it would be easy to cultivate pride, right? Like, like ha, I have a special message for you guys. God gave it to me. See, he didn't give it to you guys. He gave it to me, and I'm going to give it to you. I'm special. You know, I feel like that'd be our attitude if we were given a special, uh, something special to unveil. But Paul, on the other hand, he's saying no. It has nothing to do with who I am. It's God's grace given to me. It's for you guys that I have the privilege of unveiling this mystery. And I think that's an example for us to follow, uh, an example of humility. You say, okay, Paul delivers it. Now, what is it? Well, we saw the deliverer, verse, verse 1 through 4, and now let's look at the definition. He defines it for us here. Verse 5, he opens. Verse 5, he says, this, this mystery, which was not made known to the sons of men in other generations, as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. So before he tells us what it is, he gives us disclaimer. He says, he says you know, it, it wasn't made known to these sons of men as it is to us now. And you say, why does he disclaim it before giving it in verse 6? Well, this is a little academic here. I'll try to, try to stay with me here, but let me try to explain it. We need to think about it like this for a moment. These sons of men he's talking about in other generations, those were people in the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, the, the mystery was still hidden. The mystery of Christ was still hidden. So when God would prophesy, for example, to Abraham, he prophesied to Abraham and he said, all nations will be blessed in you. And Abraham didn't see that prophecy play out because the mystery was still hidden. But Abraham took it by faith that it would. Another example, Isaiah, he predicts that he will make someone the light of the nations. That would be Christ, now that we know. But Isaiah didn't know that back. He didn't see the culmination of that prophecy. So you have these sons of men in other generations back in the Old Testament and they are taking by faith, even though they don't see the culmination of it as the mystery is revealed. And this revealing, it takes place after Christ's death in the church age. Uh, if I could illustrate it this way, to help you understand, uh, when Emma and I first started dating, we watched this movie. And I won't give the title because it'll distract you, but we watched this movie, and it left us with a lot of questions. It left us with a lot of, what happened to this person? What happened to these people? What, how's this plot going to resolve? And then just a few weeks ago, we went to see the second film. And after watching it, we're like, oh, okay, that makes sense. You know, th this character happened to this person. This, this plot played out in this way. Now, just illustrating like this, obviously, every illustration fails. But it's like the Old Testament is movie number one, you know. They don't see the, the revealing of it. They don't see how it plays out until the New Testament comes, until the mystery is revealed. And that's kind of like movie number two. It explains it. So coming back to the passage here, um, we, we see things. Abraham and Isaiah were told parts of it, but they weren't given the whole mystery. And they didn't understand it all. And then fast forward to the church age, where you have, as verse 5 tells us, you have, you have these holy apostles and prophets. It is fully revealed to them. So I hope that wasn't too confusing. I hope it made some sense. But before Paul gives the mystery in verse 6, he says, verse 5, disclaimer, these people in the Old Testament, these other generations didn't know it, but it's now being revealed to us. That's just what he's saying here. And then verse 6, it gives us the mystery. Here's what it is. Verse 6, this mystery is, uh, New American Standard says, to be specific, the mystery is, is that the Gentiles, that would be those that aren't Jews, are fellow heirs, members of the same body, partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. That's this mystery. That's this, uh, this groundbreaking information that Paul gives. You say, that's not really groundbreaking. 
Well, the fact that Gentiles could be on the same level as Jews, it was a huge, um, it was revolutionary to think of in this time. Uh, A commentator puts it like this, puts it way better than I could ever put it. He said, the idea of including Gentiles in one body with Jews was the spiritual equivalent of saying that lepers were no longer to be isolated, that they were now perfectly free to intermingle and associate with everyone else as normal members of society. In the mind of most Jews, their spiritual separation was Gentiles was so absolute and so right that the thought of total equality before God was inconceivable and little short of blasphemy. So basically, basically in this time, Gentiles were not allowed, according to the Jews, Gentiles were not allowed to be on the same spiritual standing as Jews. So Jews would view Gentiles as, you know, lesser beings. And Paul is saying, no, no. He, he comes in and says, even though he could get a lot of backlash for this, he says, no, the Gentiles are fellow heirs, those who are saved, members of the same body. They have the same opportunity as the Jews. And as he said in verse 2, or excuse me, verse 3, he said that, he, he hints at it in Ephesians 1, Ephesians 2, and then he tells us in Ephesians 3, Gentiles have the same opportunity to come to Christ as Jews. And I know that, seems, that may seem to us like whatever, you know, but to them, it was a huge deal. It was revolutionary. The fact that every person on the planet would have the opportunity to come to Christ. Paul mentions it in other, I'll, I'll give you a few um, I'll give you a few scriptures here. He mentions it in other books. Colossians, for example. We looked at this last time in Colossians. Colossians 1.26, he says, This mystery was hidden for ages and generations, but is now revealed to his saints. And here's what it is. The mystery is Christ in you. And the audience of this book were Jews and Gentiles. Christ in you, the hope of glory. So he's telling us in Colossians, this mystery, he, he, uh, he compresses it just to the mystery is Christ and what he means is everyone has opportunity in Christ, Jews and Gentiles alike. And then he says, he clarifies in chapter 2, Christ is, or excuse me, the mystery is that you may know the knowledge of God's mystery, which is Christ. So this mystery here is Christ, the idea that Christ died, not just for Jews, but for everybody. Everyone has an opportunity to come to Jesus Christ. So that's the mystery here. Paul reveals it. Uh, it, it doesn't seem huge to us because a lot of us, most of us here are probably Gentile believers. Most of the believers we know are Gentiles. But in this time, it was groundbreaking, earth-shattering to even believe that Gentiles would have the opportunity to come to Christ. So that's the mystery here. Paul delivers it uh, from Revelation. He defines it. But then he expresses the importance of declaring it. We find this in the next three verses here. He declares this mystery. And there's so much we could land on here. These three verses are, are wonderful. But, uh, for example, Paul's humility flows out. If we read verse 8, he says, he says, this mystery was given to me, though I am the very least of all the saints. And I, and I scratch my head when I read that. I think, man, if he's the worst, I must really be a horrible person, right? Because he's expressing here, I'm the worst of all the saints. And I was given the grace to share this to you. But again, so much we could land on here, but let's go ahead and see some principles for declaring this mystery. See, he tells us, he delivers it, he defines it, but he doesn't stop there. He could stop there and say, okay, this mystery, here's what it is, declare it. But instead, he shows us, this is how I declare it. This gospel, this mystery, I was made a minister according to the gift of God's grace, which was given me by the working of his power. He shows us. So I think we can derive two principles from this. Firstly, to declare the mystery, you must be empowered by God. Gospel declaration, mystery declaration is empowered by God. Do you see that in verse 7? I was made a minister, not according to my abilities, but it was according to the grace of God. It was by the working of his power, right? It, it's not us. It's not our power. It's not something that we can do. It's his power. If I could illustrate it this way, you have, you have gloves, right, on a table over here. These gloves on their, own, on their own merit can't move. They're lifeless. They're inanimate. They're unable to move. But if someone walks up to them, puts the gloves on, those gloves are then given the ability of the hand. As the hand moves, the gloves move. 
as the gloves are given power by the hand. The hand inside the glove empowers it to move. What happens to the glove happens to, or what happens to the hand happens to the glove. So it's Christ inside of us that empowers us, just like a hand inside of a glove empowers the glove. It is Christ in us that gives us the power to declare the mystery of Christ. Verse 7 telling us, it's God's grace, it's God's power in us that gives us that ability. So, that, so Paul here, verse 7, he tells us this gospel declaration, it is given by God, the power. But then secondly, gospel declaration, mystery declaration is given to all people. Verse 8, I preach, we preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ to bring to light for everyone. See, that was new, remember? It was just the Jews. But now it's everyone. To everyone, what is the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God? So Paul, he's exceptionally clear here that this light of the mystery must be brought to everyone, not just certain people, not just the Jews, to Gentiles, to everybody. And he tells them, I believe we can apply that here as, I think when we think of declaring the gospel, declaring the mystery of Christ, we think it's just for unbelievers, right? We'll think, you know, and that's true, we do need to share it with unbelievers, but we must remind believers as well, here's Christ, we encourage them. He says here, the, the unsearchable riches of Christ. I, I believe that goes back to what we talked about in Ephesians 1. We looked at the vast riches that we have in Christ. Paul puts it here, the unsearchable riches of Christ. But he said, we use the illustration of uh, the landowners in Australia. They lived in poverty. They didn't realize the gold they had beneath their feet. And I've used that several times. So let me use another here. During the Great Depression, a man named Mr. Yates, he owned a huge piece of land in Texas where he raised sheep. He had financial problems, which brought him to the brink of bankruptcy. Then an oil company, believing there might be oil on his land, asked for permission to drill. With nothing to lose, he agreed. Soon, at a shallow depth, the workmen struck the largest oil deposit in that time. Overnight, Mr. Yates became a billionaire. The amazing thing, though, is that the untapped riches were there all along. He just didn't know it. So very similar to that other illustration. Believers, just like unbelievers, need reminded of the gospel. They need reminded of the unsearchable riches of Christ. Some believers go through life either of ignorance or just forgetting of the riches they have in Christ. And they're, and they're not failing to necessarily because we have victory in Christ, but they're struggling. They're struggling to live the Christian life because they forget of the unsearchable riches they have in Christ. So just like uh, Mr. Yates here, he, didn't, he taps into these riches. He didn't realize out of ignorance or he didn't know there was oil there. And just like him, we must, we must tap into these riches in Christ. So Paul here, he's saying, this declaration of the mystery of the gospel is given to all people, uh, Jews, Gentiles, believers, unbelievers, preach the unsearchable riches of Christ to everyone. That's the plan of the mystery here. So we must declare it, as Paul says. Two points, we must declare it to everyone, and it must be declared by his power. So number one, Paul, he ever so humbly, he delivers the mystery. He Secondly, he defines the mystery of Christ. Everyone becomes one in Christ. That's what the mystery is. Thirdly, he declares it. You can only declare it by the power of Christ. You can only declare it you declare it to all people, no exceptions. And then number four, we see what the mystery is destined for. What's the whole point of it? What's the destination of the mystery? What's the whole purpose of doing this? What's the end goal? Why, do there, why does there have to be a mystery? Where is it all leading to? And I believe it's simply put. It's for his glory, for God's glory. You say, where do we see that? Let's read verses 10 and 11. Verse 10, this mystery was brought to light so that through the church, that would be believers, so that through the church, the manifold of wisdom might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. You say, who's that? Who's, who are these rulers and authorities in the heavenly places? Well, Colossians 1, Ephesians 6, there's many passages that tell us that this would refer to angelic beings. Colossians 1 uses these terms, the authorities and rulers in heavenly places. Uh, Ephesians 6 refers to them as fallen angelic beings. Many other verses echoing this truth. But I don't think 
I, I found this verse very interesting when I read it at first. I was like, why is it important to express wisdom to these angels through the church? And I, I think that's something we don't really think about. We don't re realize that angels are watching us, right? I, I don't think we realize that angels are spectating events of the church. Angelic beings are watching. Uh, some examples from the Bible. Uh, we have uh, Luke 15.10. Just so I tell you, there is joy before the angels of God over one sinner who repents. So we know the angels are spectating those who become saved, and they, it, it provokes them to have joy in that event. And we also see that the angels are spectating church discipline. 1 Timothy 5, in the presence of God, Jesus, and the angels... I charge you to keep these rules without prejudicing, doing nothing from partiality. So we know Jesus and God and the angels are spectating what happens in church discipline, according to 1 Timothy. I forgot to put this one on the screen, but 1 Corinthians tells us that the angels are witnessing the submission of believing women to the church. You just have all these examples of the angels watching what's going on in the church. But they're not only watching, they're also participating. Hebrews 1 and to which of the angels has he ever said, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet? Are they, referring to angels, not all ministering spirits sent out to serve for the sake of those who are to inherit salvation? Are the angels not involved in, in serving those who are saved, those who inherit salvation? So with all that, putting all that together, the angels spectating all these events in the church, the angels participating in serving believers. With all that in mind, we come back to verse 10, and we see these angels, these rulers, authorities in heavenly places, are observing the church. And because, as they observe the church, they are seeing the wisdom of God. They are seeing God's wisdom play out in us, in believers. You say, why is that important? Well, there's a song that we sang several years ago at the college it's titled, I Stand Redeemed. And I believe the second verse nails it on the head here. I'm going to read the lyrics to you. It says, As I gaze upon my Savior, this is the testimony of a believer in heaven one day. As I gaze upon my Savior at the wounds he bore for me, I will sing of his salvation, bought with blood upon the tree. Here's the key phrase. While the host of angels listen to a song they cannot sing, I will, hear, I will voice my praise to Jesus with the song of the redeemed. See, the angels, they're witnessing all these events. They witness Adam and Eve sinning for the first time. They witness all the events playing up to Christ dying for the church. They witness how the church reacts and glorifies God. We're doing it right now. We're opening the scriptures right now in glory and in reverence to the Father. We're glorifying God. And you see how the angels, they're watching this. And they're, they're like, wow. The, the reason that God would do that for them. Something he never did for us. He's doing that for these people. And it causes them to worship God. So they see this playing out. And it causes them to see the wisdom of God. And to glorify him. Charles Spurgeon said it like this. There is not an angel in heaven. With whom the meanest saint might wish to exchange estates. For though the angels excel us now. We shall certainly excel them in the world to come. We shall be nearer the, the throne, the eternal throne, than any one of them, because Christ is our brother and not the brother of angels. He is the God-man in one person, and there was never God and angel in like union. So, uh, so as we put that all together and come back to verse 10, we see that through the church, through the observation of the church, through the spectating of the church, these angels are watching and they see God's wisdom playing out in the church, and that causes them. Verse 11, this was according to the eternal purpose that he was realized in Christ Jesus our Lord. And, and I believe it's to give glory to God. Verse 11, this, this was according to the eternal purpose, to give glory to him. This all happens with the angels because it's glory. Remember, the purpose of the church is to give glory to God. The purpose, according to Psalm 19, the purpose of the universe is to tell of the glory, to declare of the glory of God. And then the angels, they're watching. They're watching the church. They're watching the wisdom of God play out. And that causes them to, to invoke in this eternal purpose 
of glorifying God. I think 1 Corinthians sums up this point nicely. 1 Corinthians says this, For us there is one God, the Father, from whom are all things and for whom we exist. We exist for God. We exist to glorify him. And one Lord Jesus Christ through whom are all things and through whom we exist. We exist because we're made for God. We're made to glorify him. It's for him that we exist, to glorify him. So as we wrap up this point, the angels are watching the church. Verse 10, they see the wisdom of God play out. They're like, wow, look what God's doing for them. Look how they react to it in praise. We should glorify God because of that. So it just, it just exceedingly grows the glory to God. And that's the destination of the mystery too. The goal of it, the destination of it, to give glory to God. As we close this morning, we see one final point. We saw that Paul, he, he delivers the mystery. Humbly, he does it humbly, he doesn't gloat. He defines it. He said, this is what the mystery is, that Gentiles, that all people are one in Christ that come to him. And then he declares it. He, he shows us, guys, this is how you declare the mystery. You need to be empowered by God. You need to give it not to just some people, not just to the Jews, to all people. Declare it to all people. And then we see what, what, the, what the mystery is destined for. The whole point of it is to amplify the glory to God. And then finally, he shows us how this mystery is a delight to us. Verse 12, in whom we have boldness, talking of Christ, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence through our faith in him. So I ask you not to lose heart over what I am suffering for you, which is your glory. You say, why is the mystery a delight to us? Because, as the verse says, we have access. Not, not timid access, I'm afraid. We have access with confidence. Come to Christ in confidence. Those who are saved can come to Christ with boldness. Remember the Old Testament? Only the priest could go in there like once a year. If he did the slightest thing wrong, boom, he was dead. But now we have confidence because of Christ. He's the mediator between God and man. We can come to Christ confidently and boldly. Hebrews 4 nails it. Hebrews 4 says, For we do not, referring to Christ, for we do not have a high priest, that would be Christ, who is unable to sympathize Thighs with our weaknesses, but one who is in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then, because of this, let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. We have a high priest that lived this life. He was tempted as in we are. He understands what we're going through. He sympathizes with us. So when we come to Christ, we don't have to be I know you don't understand, but this is what I'm going through. No, he went through the same thing. If I, he probably went through worse than we'll ever go through. And he understands what it's like. So that's the delight of the mystery. We can come to Christ. We don't have to be afraid. We don't have to wonder, oh, is he going to understand? No, verse 13, verse 12. We, in Christ, we have boldness. We have access with confidence through our faith in him. That's the delight of this whole mystery. The mystery being Jesus Christ. As we close this morning, just some quick application points. How do we apply this? It's a little academic, what we've seen, but I hope it made sense. Let's apply it. This mystery, let's apply it to our lives. First, let's know it. Let's know the mystery. This mystery is Christ. Let's know Christ. As believers, we must know it. Get into the Word. I encourage you. Get into the Word. Know Christ. Continue to learn about him. Continue to learn what he's done for you, what he, who he is as a person. Uh, you say, where do I start? Well, the Gospel of John is a good place to start. It talks about Christ. It goes down through there, John 1, and then it shows his acts. It shows his miracles, what he did, ultimately ending with him sacrificing his life. And you say, that's kind of a long book. Well, how about the Gospel of Mark? It's only uh, 16 chapters, I believe. It's the shortest of the Gospels. Another good start would be um, maybe the, my favorite are the prison epistles. I'm going through those. They're short, Colossians 4, four chapters, Ephesians 6 chapters. They're a little deep in doctrine, but they're very helpful. They're very encouraging. That's just my encouragement to you. Know the mystery. You say, what's the mystery? It's Christ. 
Go into the books. Read them. Learn about Christ. Learn about what he did. If you're looking for encouragement, if you're looking to learn about God's attributes, looking about his omniscience, omnipotence, things like that, go into the Psalms. The Psalms give a trove of just wonderful, uh, wonderful, encouraging um, scripture that you can read there. Read a Psalm. But my point is this. We must grow in Christ. We must know the mystery. That's what Paul was just showing us in here. Know this mystery. It's Christ. And then second point, second application point, share it. If you know it, we'll never know it as good as we should, not until we're saved, but continue to know it. But then as you are learning and knowing it, share it. Paul, I think it's evident that Paul was incredibly passionate about proclaiming Christ, even to the point of endangering his own life, right? There were so many times that he was, he was stoned. He's like, I got stoned, but I'm going to go right back into the city to share the gospel. He was... He was recklessly involved in sharing the gospel. I think that's an example for us to share Christ. Share it with those who are lost, right? Grab a tract. uh, Put one on the the, the table at the restaurant. Give one to the cashier. Just just mention Christ. You know, this is who Christ is. Uh, Have a blessed day. Get Get them talking, you know. But not just unsafe people. Mention Christ to those. Someone comes up to you. I've been having a rough week. Let's talk about it. Let's talk about Christ. Let's, uh, let me encourage you. Let me remind you of the unsearchable riches that we have in Christ. Share the mystery, number two. Number three, uh, the last application point. We know it, we share it, but let's, let's, uh, let's embrace it. Let's love it. Let's love the mystery. Paul closes out verse 12 and 13 with this. Be confident. Come to Christ boldly. You have confidence. You, you can access the throne of grace freely, not just initially to get saved, but anytime you want to ask for forgiveness. First John tells us that. Anytime you need help, you can go to Christ. So embrace it. Love it. God is not angry at you anymore, believer. Remember Romans 1, the wrath of God is revealed to all people. But once you're saved, you are no, he is no longer angry at you. You are loved by God. Go to him. Are you struggling? Run to Christ. The song we sang this morning, right? All I have is Christ, right? All I have is Christ. Go to him. Embrace it and love it. And I I just thought I'd, before I close out this morning, I thought I would just extend this invitation. If you need anything, if you need anything, here's my information. I want to throw this out there. My wife and I, we'd love to talk with you. We're young. We're not, we're not the most smart people in the world. But you say, I, you say this stuff is new to me, this mystery, this, this Christ stuff, it's new to me. We'd love to talk to you. If you don't know this, the pastor would love to talk to you. We'd love to introduce you to Christ. You say, I know Christ, but I'm struggling. I'd like to talk. Hit me up. We'll talk. We'll go out, my wife and I. Gentlemen, if you want to meet with me, we'll go out. Ladies, you can meet, meet with my wife and I. We, will, we would be happy to talk with you, to encourage you about Christ. Remember what Paul told us. He said, we need to be knit together, right? We need to fellowship together. We can't just go through. This isn't a lone ranger type of, of, of religion. I don't like the word religion, but this isn't a lone ranger type of relationship. We aren't to do this by ourselves. We come together. We encourage each other. We fellowship together. So I thought I'd throw that out there and if, if, if the, just contact me if you need anything. If you say, I don't want to talk to you, well, <laughs> pastor's here, elder's here. We're all here for you. We're all here together. So as we close this morning, I just want to encourage you. Get to know the mystery that we talked about today, this mystery of Christ. Know it, share it, love it. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your word. We thank you so much for this mystery that we were able to look at today. This beauty of Christ that we were able to study this morning. The fact that we are all one in Christ, no matter who we are. It's not based on our ethnicity. It's not based on our cultural status. It's not based on our financial status or any of that. But rather on your grace, on your mercy, on us sinful beings. We thank you for this mystery. We thank you for Christ, someone who was born of a virgin, someone who lived a perfect life, never sinning once, something we could never do. He unconditionally loves us. He 
gave himself up for us. He was scourged. He was condemned to a miserable death. He rose on the third day. He ascended to heaven, where he is now at the right hand of the Father, making intercession for us. Help us to never get over that reality, Father. Help us to never take it for granted, to, to never stop welling up with tears when we think of it, to think of the amazing grace that was given to us. I pray for believers here. I pray that you would empower them, as we saw in the verse this morning, empower them to, to, to declare this mystery, this mystery of Christ, to declare it to all people, not just unbelievers, that's wonderful, yes, but also to believers, someone struggling. Can I encourage you? Can I help you? Help them to declare that, that mystery. I pray for unbelievers, Father. I pray that you would soften their hearts, that you would prepare them to receive Christ. Help us to go out as your, as your ambassadors, as we would introduce them to Christ, as we would spark a conversation with them. Empower us. Give us courage to give them the message. I pray for each one of us here this morning that you would give us strength, that you would help us to persevere. Hard times will come. Suffering will come. And we just pray that you will help us to, to uh, persevere to the end. As Paul said, to, 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 to shoot for the mark, to keep our eyes ahead of us, not behind us, but ahead of us for our ultimate glorification one day. I pray, Father, for the activities this afternoon. We just pray, Father, they would be God-honoring, that they would uh, help us to grow together as believers, help us to glorify you, which is the ultimate goal of our lives. We pray, Father, you would give us safety as we go our separate ways in a moment. We thank you all in Jesus Christ's name. Amen.